please enter your password. Then press pound. You have nine saved voice messages. To listen to your messages, press one. First saved voice message. Hi, William. It's Bob Serkin. Um, I got your email uh, last night, and I, I sent you one back in case you haven't seen it. And I thought I would be here, but I just got called out of town. So uh, I am not going to be here over the weekend, and I'm not sure when I'm getting back. Uh, I'm sorry I'm going to miss you, and um, I hope that your project works out well. Thanks very much uh, for uh, thinking of me, and I'll talk to you down the road. Thanks very much. Hi, William. Um, this is Shelly Terry. I was just making sure you were still going to be in town for Memorial Weekend since today's Tuesday and it's um, the following Monday. <laughs> and see if you are already in Atlanta. Uh, just let me know just so I can make plans accordingly since it is a holiday weekend. My phone number is, I don't know, we talked last week, is 706-253-1406. Thank you. Message. Hi, Mr. Stonberg. This is Young Jones. And hear from you. Can call me at 969 <laughs> This is Young Jones. I'd like to hear from you. Uh, yes, may I speak with Eunice Jones, please? This is William Scarborough. Good. Is this Eunice Jones? How are you today? Good. Um, I just was calling because we had tentatively scheduled to sit down and talk about uh, your son Clifford tomorrow at 4 o'clock. July 29, 1979, police find the badly decomposed bodies of two teenagers at the bottom of a heavily wooded ravine in southwest Atlanta. One of them is quickly identified as 14-year-old Edward Hope Smith. But the second body is in such an advanced state of decomposition, it's impossible to say who it is. But now, more than a year later, Fulton County authorities say they finally think they know the identity of that second body. They say it is probably 14-year-old Alfred James Evans, one of the youngsters the Atlanta Missing Children's Task Force has been looking for. From the discovery of Alfred Evans and Edward Hope Smith to the arrest of Wayne Williams on June 21, 1981, 68 African-American children and young adults had been murdered in Atlanta. Ms. Evans, how has this last year been for you? Uh, like, as I say, I don't really know. I don't really know. How Your child has been missing now for a year. There's a possibility now that this might be him that they found. How have you been able to get through it? Faith. Faith in God. Sunday night, 11 o'clock, you found out that the body had been found? I, 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 yeah, I found that the body had been found, but you know, like I said, I only heard a glimpse of it. I only heard a last portion of it, so I didn't know where the body had been found at, so I had to wait till the next newscast come on. So when I heard the next newscast, I uh, recognized his foot in the shoe and uh, called the police. Day by day, year by year, we have these kinds of experiences. He will take this evil, this tragedy, give it meaning, give it purpose. <laughs> Was he the kind of little boy to run away or to be missing for any period of time? No, uh, never. He's never run away? Never. He's just a working kind of little boy like to have a little something. When did you decide to call the police? I called them Saturday morning, I mean Sunday morning when I got up. What do you think has happened to him? Where do you think he is? I don't know, Lord. I don't know. I really don't know. I just wish he'd come on home to me. Thank you, Thank Mr. You.
But even though the description of Luby Jeter has a lot in common with the other missing and murdered children, and even though, one more time, but even though the description of Luby Jeter has a lot in common with the other missing and murdered children, and even though nobody's seen or heard from him for over four days, the case has not been turned over to the Missing Children's Task Force, and police officials aren't saying why not. Eventually, a list was compiled of 30 victims sharing similar characteristics and trace evidence. Threads containing fibers apparently stemming from the same sources. News of these fibers spread rapidly throughout the community as the media relentlessly covered the story. There is a theory that the killer is dumping his victims in the rivers in order to wash off any evidence from the bodies. It is also a lot tougher to investigate when police don't even know where the victim was put into the water. A river of this size with 40, 45 miles of area uh, is impossible to watch every place that's uh, people have access to. This river access Walker speaks of is everywhere. Bridges that run over the Chattahoochee, 10 or 12 bridges that are dark and very lonely at night. On the morning of May 22nd, 1981, 22-year-old Wayne Bertram Williams was pulled over and questioned, and then released by FBI officer Greg Gilliland after crossing the James Jackson Parkway Bridge. Officers under the bridge reported hearing a splash in the water as Williams drove slowly across. A splash that they thought could have been made by a body hitting the water. Did they ever call you a suspect? Did they ever use the word suspect? They, they did, strong and a suspect. They, they openly said, you killed Nathaniel Cater, and you know it and you're lying to us. They said that. And they said it on a number of occasions. They said it on that night. Uh, one of the task force captains on the scene pointed his finger at me and said it and said he was tired of all the uh, BS about working the long hours, working the stakeouts, and that he was ready to pull the thing to an end. On the evening of June 4, 1981, Williams was officially brought into the Atlanta Federal Building and questioned throughout the night. In terms of our efforts tonight, we have not ended up with the information that would result in an arrest. That's about all we have to say at this point in time. We're not holding anyone. Nobody's under arrest. That is correct. No, he has not. Is he gone? But he has, he's free to leave whatever he wants to leave. Get out of the way now. We've gone over this before and you've stated it, but again, as of today, uh, is the impression still that it's, it's more than one person committing these crimes? It has consistently been our position based upon the evidence that we, we do not have a single person that, has, that is involved in the cases involving the children. That is our position today. We know based upon the evidence, and we're looking at the data that we have at our disposal we're looking at things such as the modus operandi, that is how people commit crimes. We, and based upon all of that, using our own experience in the field of law enforcement, the experience and opinions of those who have consulted with us, including other law enforcement agencies, our consultants, etc., we can say with certainty that we do not have one person responsible for the cases involving the missing and murdered children in our city. Shortly after this interview, Wayne Williams was arrested for the murders of Jimmy Ray Payne and Nathaniel Cater. He was convicted on February 22, 1982, and then judicially assigned guilt for the murders of 22 additional victims of the 30 appearing on the task force list. And so the Atlanta murders officially came to an end as authorities quietly dismantled the task force on missing and murdered children. All ongoing investigations stopped and six murder cases from the task force list remain unsolved to this day. 38 other young African Americans were murdered in Atlanta during this time, but were not included on the list. Their cases also remain unsolved.
night of excitement, a night of fun. But it didn't start off as fun. And while the entire city seems to be celebrating raising all that money last night, there may be still more rejoicing yet to come, especially if Sammy Davis Jr. comes through on his pledge to raise over a million dollars to help stop the crimes against Atlanta's children. He's already a quarter of the way there, and now he's fallen in love with our city. We cannot let what happens here go unheeded and unanswered. And if I sound like sometimes a, a, a little bigger than life, it's because maybe that's what the man upstairs put me here for, to bring attention to something and to make sure that people listen. Wayne Williams is highly intelligent, meticulous, ambitious, and detail-oriented. His mind retains names, dates, and facts in encyclopedic fashion. Even though he stands only five foot six inches tall, speaking with Wayne Williams leaves one with the impression that he is also bigger than life. But Wayne Williams has a strong tendency to manipulate the information he possesses forcing one to question his grasp and or presentation of reality. Some would say he's a liar. Wayne Williams was born on May 27, 1958. His parents, Homer and Faye Williams, both school teachers, provided a stable upbringing in a modest middle-class African-American home located in a rather charming neighborhood. During his childhood years, Williams was known as a very bright student electronically inclined, and adept at anything that interested him. Wayne Williams is an Atlantan born and bred, 23 years old, a product of the city's public school system. He went to Anderson Park Elementary School and graduated from Frederick Douglass High School on Hightower Road, Northwest. People who know Williams say he is a highly intelligent young man, a good student when he was in school. As a student, he was extremely bright very intelligent young man, and uh, um, quiet, uh, very uh, respectful, honest uh, student, very dependable, and uh, just an ideal student. Williams' resume lists a number of clubs and organizations he says he belonged to in high school, National Honor Society, ROTC Rifle Team. But his high school class yearbook does not show him in any of the organization pictures. Williams' acquaintances say he is one who tends to exaggerate his accomplishments and his contacts. His resume's list of professional references includes many familiar names in the local media. Most of those references say they knew Williams only briefly and not very well. But it is clear Wayne Williams is a bright and ambitious person. He started a radio station in his parents' home when he was only 12. In his teens, he spent time hanging around many of the city's radio stations, doing odd jobs, mostly as an unpaid volunteer, and talking to the people he met about broadcasting. He was a bit old for his age, so to speak. I'm saying that to talk to a kid that age about something that you're doing as an adult, and he's talking on your level, it's really amazing, and uh, as I said before, he was a likable type of individual, maybe because of the, the knowledge of the, of the industry, as far as I'm concerned. A short time after graduating from high school, Williams claims he did some photography work for the Atlanta Fire Bureau. Deputy Chief A.D. Bell is listed on Williams' resume as a reference, but Bell refuses to comment on Williams, and a fire department spokeswoman says Williams was never employed there. I, I want, I'm gonna say Williams a liar, uh, and I can, I can say that because he told me that he lied under oath at trial. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, uh, what do you call it? I don't know if you can impugn Wayne Williams, but I'm not impugning him. He, he's a liar. Several years ago, he was arrested for impersonating a police officer and for using police emergency lights on his car. The charges were reduced and handled in traffic court. In 1977, Williams began offering his photographic services to the Atlanta TV stations. This film of a pre-dawn house fire was shot by Wayne Williams and aired on Action News in October of 1978. 
Williams would drive the city streets through the night, listening to police monitors in his car, racing to the scene of accidents, fires, and homicides, then peddling film of what had happened to the news departments. But the freelance photography business was never very successful, and most recently, Williams says he has acted as a talent scout, helping young people get ahead in the entertainment industry. And what we do, for instance, like in uh, this particular group, it's our job to take some entertainers, say, basically from the street, polishing them up, get them professional, and try and shop a record deal for them. And we had a young group that we had been putting together since 1977, a group called Gemini. And what we're trying to do is just capture the marketplace, basically, that the Jackson 5 had. And so I actually started off working with some of the bigger local bands that we had. As a matter of fact, um, when Alicia Bridges did her thing, I love the nightlight, I happened to be at the studio when she did it. So this is how I got broke in. And after I got my feet wet with that, then I, I met a producer by the name of Willie Hunter. And that name has come up in the trial. He was a producer for Channel 2 that, again, I knew <laughs> from a radio station and, and the news media. And he was an artist manager and had several bands and groups. And Willie asked me to work with them on a record project. This was the first, this was in 1978. And it was later in, oh, probably the latter part of 78 that I decided to go out and try to put together my own group, which was Silk at the time. It was an all-female group. It was two of the young ladies who used to work for me at the radio station and their sister. And then later the group eventually evolved over a couple of years' time into Gemini. It, uh, some of us thought that perhaps it could be a police officer or someone perceived to be a police officer, acting as a police officer. And lo and behold, what do we find out after Williams is identified, but uh, some people thought he was the police. He, he, went, he was a freelance photographer who went to uh, fire scenes, taking photographs. He would drive old police detective cars with lights and sirens sometimes. Uh, he had even been arrested for impersonating a police officer. He had the perfect bait to gain the confidence of young people, and that is he was a talent scout. This is another thing he used to his advantage to have uh, children around him all the time, young people. And I might add, mostly boys, I'm not talking about girls. Uh, his flyers that he put out indicated he was a talent scout, and if you have any ability, call me. What the flyers came about is when we made the decision with Gemini to, to not be, I guess you could say, a, a chilling circuit band. When we made the decision with them to, to attempt to engage a record contract for them, during the summer of 1979, I made several, a number of trips all over the country. Uh, to Los Angeles, I met with uh, Wade Marcus, who's a very, very well-known producer with the Silvers, our Freddie Perrin, our ex-Motown producer, member of the corporation. And I took a couple of group members with me, and I had been exchanging demos with him as well. I also took a trip to Memphis, Tennessee, a gentleman by the name of Bobby McVeigh, who has a group called The Dealer, better known as The Deal, which L.A. and Babyface came out of that group. We did a showcase with them in Tennessee. Also in Florida, there was a gentleman I dealt with named Robert Tillman, whose uncle used to do writing for Elvis Presley, who owns a publishing company there. Now, the way the auditions were done, and I think you'll find this well documented, the first thing we did was I contacted on our letterhead every single uh, public school music program in the city of Atlanta. We wrote them and we actually visited all the music teachers. And when I say we, myself and also my assistant, Carla Bailey. And we had release forms that if they were under 18, a parent had to come to the auditions or sign a release form. When we started the auditions in 1980, which was about November, I contacted the task force, informed them what we were doing and all because we were working with young people and children. That should be on record. They were sent a copy of the letterhead and all of this. So, so that, as a matter of fact, I talked with, um, oh, the name will come to you in a minute. I believe her name was Fuller, Detective Fuller on the task force. Uh, my input into the trial was really very limited on anything. Very limited. And uh, the, the only knowledge I, I really had, William, about the case was basically what I read in the newspapers. Because the attorneys were so transfixed in what they were doing that it was almost like an afterthought, oh yeah, Wayne, what's this? So I, I, was, in, I was really in the, in the dark. See, this is all I'm talking about. 
where you have a juror who's saying, well, uh, he must have did something. Well, where is your facts? And that's all I'm saying. Where's your facts? Oh, you got, well, he had these clothes in his car and these children's clothes and these ropes in his car. Where are they? And you plant all of these little uh, fires and now you create a bonfire. And you know who's caught in the middle of that bonfire? Wayne Williams. And he's helpless to do anything about it because he knows he's innocent. Why? Because Wayne Williams is always taught you obey the law, okay? But he's also being taught by his parents, you also be an entrepreneur. So he's caught up in this, this whirlwind, and he can't do a damn thing about it. But Wayne Williams' case was tried in a superior court, and he was found guilty, and they appealed the case to the Supreme Court of the state of Georgia. And I was one of the seven justices on the Supreme Court that heard the case and decided the case on appeal. The uh, conviction in the Superior Court was affirmed by the Supreme Court of the state of Georgia, six to one. I filed a, a dissent, about a 40 page dissent in which I dissented and said that in my opinion, he was not convicted. Uh, uh, he should not have been convicted of, of the crimes based upon the evidence and they uh, presented at the trial in the Superior Court. I'm just curious as to why is it that that, that wasn't a universal thought or, or universal feeling across the board at, at that time? I couldn't tell you that and support my reason. Um, I don't mean I wouldn't tell you, but I, I cannot go on record as to what I think was involved because I can't prove it. This is a tease. Five, four, three, two. One of Atlanta's missing children is no longer missing. Police are assuming the remains are of either Darren Glass, who disappeared in September, or Jeffrey Lamar Mathis, who disappeared last March. No clothes were found at the site. They could have decomposed in all this time. Another body was found yesterday in DeKalb County. It was easy to make an identity in this case. That body was 11-year-old Patrick Baltazar. Patrick Baltazar was found on a steep hill at, on a, where there were an industrial park. And in order to get down to him, because I didn't want him to move him, we tied a rope to a tree and I went down the rope so that I could basically stand on the bank and look at the body at the same time. If I hadn't have done that, if we'd have just moved the body, he had marks on his face where he'd been lying on sticks. And if he had just been in the morgue, I might have thought these were injuries, but I was there and I'm the one who first moved his head and I saw where each stick was lying relative to his face. And I also saw threads that didn't look like they belonged on his clothes there at the scene, and we removed them on the bank at the scene. Hidden in these threads were microscopic fibers, fibers with unique characteristics stemming from what were determined to be unusual sources. Upon examining the previous 19 bodies, authorities found fibers consistent with those on Balthazar's. It was apparent that 18 of 20 victims had been in the same environment before being killed. Subsequent victims also shared these fibers. I became um, interested in, along with the task force, in knowing whether any of the cases were related, and if so, how many. So then I began an intense, intensive comparison of materials, again, not really focusing on Harrison fibers, though that's a common evidence area that was certainly included, comparing evidence from one victim to another to see if there's any common linkage that could be determined and eventually found um, uh, several fiber types that linked cases together. But once I had developed some common fibers, I began then to just concentrate on those. And as new cases would come along, I would look specifically for those fiber types in terms of linking them together. Of particular interest were fibers that experts had never seen before, green trilobal fibers. It was eventually learned that these trilobal fibers came from one manufacturer, the Wellman Corporation. 
The fibers were subsequently made into carpet by the West Point Pepperell Company in Dalton, Georgia. It's interesting because uh, my first involvement was the case was uh, looking at some fibers that Larry Peterson sent me. Um, and there were four fibers, one of which was a Wellman fiber. And I had not seen that particular fiber type before based on the cross section. Um, and uh, we were trying to figure out who manufactured it. Um, after, uh, after the research meeting or the, the meeting down in Atlanta, I actually took the photographs up to one of the technical people at Wellman. I think it was up in Boston. Showed them the fibers, the photographs, and they did identify it as their fiber. They explained that they were actually trying to get around a DuPont patent. And DuPont had, had uh, patented the trilobal structure. And so they changed the, the structure such that one of the legs was a short leg. And the purpose was to get around the patent. Um, that became important because they found out, apparently, that DuPont wasn't going after companies that were potentially violating their patent. And so they only used this cross-section for several years, and then they reverted back to a, a more uh, regular trilobal fiber. Police surmised that if a suspect surfaced with an environment containing this green carpet, it was likely that sources for the remaining fibers may also be found. When Wayne Williams was pulled over at 2.30 in the morning on May 22, 1981, after crossing the James Jackson Parkway Bridge, a viable suspect had finally materialized. Eventually, the task force entered the Williams home, stepping onto a floor of green carpet. And after searching the rooms and Williams' family vehicles, they found sources for all fiber groups. They were convinced they had finally identified their killer. The fiber had not been produced for approximately a 10-year period of time, and then some of the marketing information about the square yardage that was produced and the states that it was distributed in made it um, a, a very, very rare fiber just in and of itself. So that one fiber type, to find it as a connection to the Williams environment was very strong. Um, then to connect uh, bedspreads and throw rugs and uh, blankets and uh, uh, a leather coat that was, uh, you know, in the Williams closet and uh, his bedspread, fibers that match the, the Williams dog, and in one case, hairs that match William, him, Williams himself, um, in, in combination, a, a pair of gloves, or a glove from a pair of gloves that was in the glove compartment of the Concourse station wagon, the floorboard carpeting of a Concourse station wagon itself, which was found on cases, the um, indoor or outdoor carpeting that was in the workroom that was between the carport and Williams' bedroom, which is in the, the, the side entrance to the house. Um, you know, there's approximately 35 different fiber types that in combination would be virtually impossible for that to occur in any other environment because there's no reason to believe that any of those fiber types would normally be connected. That because that green carpet appears in the house, they're more likely to have these carpet squares or this leather coat or that blanket or that bedspread. Just the fact of building two or three fiber types together, much less to have any rare or unusual ones, you know, makes a very strong case. And then this case had, had such a large volume of different types of fibers that were, have been determined to be unusual. And, you know, with hairs and fibers in combination, it was just totally overwhelming. I mean, beyond what I would normally think would be, you know, reasonable to assume that, that you know, you would reach any conclusion other than, you know, that these victims were in this environment. Plain and simple. Police say the body of Charles Stevens was left where it could easily be found. As concrete as the discovery of these fiber sources in the Williams environment was, some pieces of the puzzle simply did not fit. The last time Charles Stevens was seen alive by anyone who knew him was about 5 o'clock yesterday when he went to this grocery store just down the hill from where he lived. At midnight, his mother reported him missing. Less than eight hours later, he was dead. Once again, the question has come up, is this case related to the others? Again, the answer is maybe. Police say they have some evidence in this case that they don't want to discuss, but say that does not mean that they are any more optimistic about solving this case. During a news Charles Stevens was abducted on October 9, 1980, and found dead the next day, October 10th. His body revealed nine different fibers from Williams' environment including fibers from the trunk liner of a 1979 Ford LTD, a car owned by the Williams family. The problem is that the Williams family didn't have access to the LTD at the time of the murder. 
It was at a dealership for repair. How could fibers from this car have been transferred to Stephen's body if it was unavailable to Wayne Williams? It wasn't until after the trial had occurred and I began checking on uh, some information that occurred during the trial where it apparent that the, the family or the, the LTD, Ford LTD, that the family owned during some period of these cases before they owned this concourse station wagon, um, that that automobile had been in and out of the shop several times and that they had, in fact, had several loaners. Uh, and in fact, the, the loaner that occurred during uh, the Stevens case, which was the case following the Jones case, therefore that the, uh, the family, in fact, did not have access to the LTD and we had trunk fibers matching off the Stevens body back to the trunk liner of the, of the LTD. And during the trial, the defense put forth these records indicating that, uh, that these rental cars were involved during these different periods of time. So that was a concern to me. If the car, in fact, was not accessible to the family, then you know, how do you explain, or how would I explain the fact that these trunk liner fibers matched? Um, so I got copies of the, uh, of the rental agreements you know, from Joe Dorlay from the Fulton County District Attorney's Office and proceeded to have um, field agents track down those automobiles, which had since been sold from the dealership as loaner cars to private individuals and had agents collect trunk liner and floorboard samples from those automobiles. And after receiving those samples from those rental cars, I found that in fact the floorboard samples of one of those, the rental car, the rental car that the family did in fact have access to did in fact match those beige carpet fibers that I've been looking for for all that time. And in addition to that, the trunk liner fibers of the rental cars, which were all Ford Fairmonts, was essentially identical to the trunk liner of the Ford LTD, which would explain how the trunk liner fibers could match the LTD, even though the LTD was not in fact in the family possession at the time. Uh, the authorities also claim that they had a white throw rug fiber from the uh, rear um, uh, seat area or the rear floor area of the station wagon Wayne Williams uh, drove and um, uh, shared with his parents with whom he was living at the time. Um, there's, there's one thing significant that you should know about this particular case and that is, is that um, Charles Stevens disappeared on the night of October 9th, 1980. His body was found the next morning, October 10th, at the East Point Trailer Park. The Williams family, however, did not obtain the white Chevrolet station wagon until October 21st, when they went down to a relative's house in Columbus, Georgia, 120 miles southwest of Atlanta, to pick it up. And that, my friends, was longer, I mean, it was far after um, uh, Charles Stevens had already been in the ground. Well, we, we, we thought the uh, fiber evidence was stronger, of course it was stronger than any case <clears throat> I've ever seen before or since, for the reason that we not only have the unusual trilobal Wellman fiber compared here among all of our uh, victims, but we also have several other sources of fibers compared on each victim. And in each case, uh, they compare favorably, and the, the probability of having four or five different comparisons of fiber from each body is astronomical. It's unbelievable. At approximately 2.30 on the morning of May 22, 1981, 22-year-old Wayne Bertram Williams drove slowly across the James Jackson Parkway Bridge over the Chattahoochee River. He presumably turned around at this Busy Bee convenience store about a mile away and then drove back across the bridge on his way to the freeway. FBI officers on stakeout under the bridge claimed they heard a splash, loud enough, they said, to have been made by a human body hitting the water. Days later, the body of Nathaniel Cater was found downstream from the bridge, 
and Wayne Williams officially became a suspect in what has become known as the Atlanta murders. That negotiation. That night at about 7 or 7.30, I picked up Willie Hunter, my business associate, who lives on uh, Simpson Road. We went from there to College Park, and that is a pretty good distance. It's maybe about a, about a, about a nine-mile trip okay, from where I stayed. We left home about, say, six, say between 6 o'clock to 7 to seven, to seven o'clock. Let me give myself an hour period because somewhere in there. But I would say it's got to be up to 6 because I remember the news started, okay? We got to Hotline of Records maybe about 7.30 p.m. We stayed at that record company from 7.30 p.m. on the night of May the 21st until probably a little bit after 9 o'clock. That time frame is critical right there. After I left there, I went and dropped Willie Hunter back at home. My father was screaming mad because it was a Thursday night and he goes to Kiwanis clubs. He grabs the station wagon, takes his cameras and tears out, cursing everything. So he stays at the Kiwanis till about 11 o'clock during that night. I have a splitting headache, I go to sleep. A telephone wakes me up, a gentleman named Peter Butts, about 11, 11.30. Willie Hunter calls me about 12.30. This is, now we're into the morning of the 22nd. So I'm fully awake by one in the morning. So I say, well, I'll just go ahead and make one other stop that I've got to do. One thing that I had to do is pick up a cassette deck that I have, this at, you probably saw it in Columbus at the house from Jackie, um, who's a friend of mine who runs a place called the San Susi Club, okay? So I woke up, I got dressed, and it was about 1.30 now. I mean, I said, well, I'm gonna head to the San Susi. But I thought about it, I said, well, before I do that, let me check out an address that I have for an audition. I searched that area for about 20 minutes, and what she had on that sheet of paper, she had something called Spanish Trace North F4. I looked all around, the apartments didn't even run that way, and I figured it was a bogus address. I turn around, I cross the bridge, and this is critical. After I crossed the bridge, I was looking for a telephone. I saw a sign that said telephone, but I couldn't see anything. I pulled off on the gravel on the side of the road. That was a little circle area that looked like a parking lot, but the telephones were gone. In other words, they had the booth, but the phones were ripped off the booth. So I turned back on the road, continued to James Jackson and Bolton Road. I cut across, cut the traffic light, went over here. At the time, the phones were against the bill and they've since moved them. I used the telephone here. That's when I made a second call to who I thought was Cheryl Johnson. I cut back across here, come out of the turn, where there's it's a lot of wooded area here. As I came out of this turn here, it's a blind turn coming here. As I got here, that was a car that had started to pull off into, as a matter of fact, he was almost to the center line, and it looked like a Ford Granada. He stopped, backed up, let me pass. The point I'm making is this. When I first came across the bridge, the first time going south, I told them, and this was correct, that I stopped to use the phone at a liquor store. That's exactly what I said. I did not know there was a liquor store here at the bridge because it was dark. This is where Officer Holden was parked. I didn't know that. I pulled off here because they had the telephone things in the middle of the thing and the phone went and I turned back on to here and continue here. This is where I told them I stopped here, picked up the boxes, turned around in this parking lot, which is what I did. I pulled into this parking lot, crossed the street, came back. This is where I said I turned around, not here. You know, the, the state's story about that bridge incident and Wayne's story about that bridge are not very different. Um, but if you believe the state's story, here's what you have to believe, okay? Officers testified that the first inkling they had of a car coming upon that bridge was the lights would hit the trees in back of the, their post, and they'd see the lights on the trees before they'd ever see the car. And the reason for that is there was a rise in that road about a mile and three tenths, mile six tenths down the road, and a car would come up that rise, and when it would, the lights would shine over the top of the rise and hit the top of those trees, but the lights wouldn't hit 
until they went over the top of the rise. You didn't see the lights. So anyway, if you believe the, 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 the police statement, Wayne Williams had to have turned his lights off before he came to that rise. They never saw those lights. On the, on, that was their testimony. Never saw those lights nah, on, hit those trees. So that means he snuck on that bridge or snuck, he, he started sneaking about one and six tenths miles away. He then drove by Agent Gilliland's car. It was about what, eight, 10, 12 feet from the road, sitting there, I think, uh, probably perpendicular to the road, and there for one purpose only, and that was to look for suspicious people on that bridge. Agent Gilliland apparently didn't see him. Uh, he didn't say anything. If, you know, he, he never, never radioed anybody. There's a car coming on the bridge with the lights out. You'd think that FBI agent looking for something suspicious on that bridge, car came by with the lights out, would have said something. He didn't. All right, then he drove on to the bridge. Then you got to believe that Wayne Williams stopped that car with the lights out, snuck on that bridge, got out of that car without making a sound. You saw that car. It was about the same shape probably back then as it is now, would be my guess. Opened the door, it didn't, it didn't creak, didn't make a sound. Walked around to the back of the car, didn't make a sound. Opened the, the trunk lid, or what we call the wagon. Didn't make a sound. Got a body out of that back of that car, was bigger than he was. Didn't make a sound. Didn't oof or anything. Picked that body up, lifted it up at least shoulder height, because you've seen that bridge, you know how tall that, that uh, uh, guardrail is, and heaved that body over the bridge without making any sound. The body splashed. Then Wayne Williams got back in the car without making a sound, turned the lights on, and proceeded not to sneak off the bridge. Right? That's what you got to believe. And you got to believe he drove to the end of the bridge, turned right into a, into a liquor store, turned back right around, and headed out with Atlanta police officer in hot pursuit. On 5-20, May the 20th, that was a young lady who called me named Cheryl Johnson. I talked with her twice. On May the 20th, she called me about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and said that she had gotten one of the flyers and I, I, either she had heard it on the radio, I can't remember which it was, and she wanted to schedule herself for an interview. I said, well, check back with me tomorrow and let me know what time. She said, well, um, I got to work early in the morning, so it's going to have to be early because I got to go to work with my cousin. So I said, well, I can be up there, whatever. She says, well, how about 7, 7.30? I still remember that. On the afternoon of the 21st, Cheryl had called my mother and left a message with her confirming the time. I had talked with her on the 20th twice, and she talked with my mother because I was out. And my mother left a message for me about the appointment and she had the time and I won't forget she underlined at 7.30 a.m. and she underlined the a.m. so I'd know what time it was and I said you mean she wants me to see at 7.30 in the morning? She says yeah. I said okay and I went to sleep. Now this is where the ball of confusion came in on, on the number. Nobody told anybody the number I dialed was nine three four seven seven six six. I want to show this for the attorneys. I want want you and this, this is I want you to watch something with Wayne Williams and, and my writing right here. This is the number I wrote for that FBI agent. The number was four three four seven seven six six. My fours and nines look identical. That's how they they started this garbage about that I gave them nine three four seven seven six six. Look on anything that I've written, any fours or whatever, and you'll see that my fours and nine look almost identical. Now here is Wayne Williams from Mid Atlanta, up at the Cobb and Fulton County border, the river three o'clock in the morning trying to locate a Cheryl Johnson for an audition that morning. Is that the one he had the um, address to? I don't want to talk about that. That's what I said. I don't want to talk about why he was out there, okay? I have my ideas, but I don't want to talk about it. But I do believe that he had that information. I believe he had it because I know his mother. She was a meticulous keeper of records. She gave him that information. Now, the 
that's all I'll say about that. During the time after his being identified as a suspect, having been seen on the bridge, and the police then, of course, went to his home with search warrants, and over a period of time, they obtained samples from the uh, carpet and other items in his automobiles and, and home. During this time, of course, the, the media, it became a, a media frenzy. Uh, cameras all over the place. Uh, anyone in law enforcement, uh, the DA's office, the police, when they would leave the building, there'd be cameras in their faces. The cameras and reporters were out on Williams' lawn in the street, camped out, if you will, all over the place. It was a media frenzy for the whole world to see. And during this time, Williams uh, left home in his car. He was followed by the police, of course. They were keeping an eye on him. And he would uh, ensue in chases with them uh, where he would try to lose them. He even stopped in front of the mayor's home one night and got out and made a scene. It. I've I've always told people, William, that the the only thing that that I've been throughout this whole case was I've been naive and I made some very stupid decisions. And one of the biggest and stupidest things I did was thinking that having worked in the media is to put my trust in the media. I did not realize the seriousness of what I was facing when I took those police on the chases and all. It, it, it wasn't a game to me, but it was out of frustration. Everybody said, well, he did it to play with but No, it wasn't. I just simply got tired of 20 and 30 cars following me everywhere I went. And at 21, 22, 23 years of age, I said, to heck with it. Let's, you know, I'm going give to you, give you something to follow me about. It was my way of lashing out. And what I didn't realize was the media was looking for every excuse they could to hang this on and crucify it on somebody. And I didn't realize every little thing that I did to be myself it was literally, as they tell you in court, used against me in a court of law. So I think the media had made up their mind while I was being questioned by the FBI that I was their man, period. Um, and, and this was based on some information that now here we are 20-some years later are finding out is quite incorrect. Wayne Williams didn't kill anybody. They know that. Several people know that now. But at the time, these people were too terrified to speak up. Well, we have a situation where in all of these cases, um, we don't know specifically uh, where Williams came into possession, if you will, of the victims or where they were actually murdered, strangulated or whatever. Uh, we only know where their bodies were found and we know where they, were, where they lived and were last seen which was in the inner city of Atlanta. And we end up with them most, for the most part in the Chattahoochee River. Uh, and so we can only theorize that Williams through one of his means, his, his bait systems that he used that was able to gain uh, access to a victim in a given situation uh, and then either take him to his home uh, where he was killed, uh, put in his automobile, uh, taken to the location where the body was dumped. We know in the last in the uh, last case involving Nathaniel Cater, uh, the last victim to come out of the river. We know in that situation that Wayne Williams was against the rail of the James Jackson Parkway Bridge in his station wagon. We know it was three o'clock in the morning. We know that uh, a young recruit police officer was under the bridge, and this is a high bridge. Uh, we know that there was a splash which brought it to his attention. He looks up and he sees lights at three o'clock in the morning on the bridge. A vehicle starts up crosses the bridge. The recruit on the other end of the bridge sees him coming. The vehicle turns around immediately and comes back across the bridge and goes a few hundred yards to I-285 where he's stopped by the FBI and police. 
We know that Williams is driving that station wagon. We know that uh, there were gloves, a cord, and a flashlight in the station wagon that they noticed. And Williams makes the statement, I know it's about those kids, ain't it? Words to that effect. That's when he first became known after two years of investigations in this series of murders. First time Wayne Williams has become known and there are no more victims found in the rivers such as this. We know that. Would you tell us what Twinkie means? A Twinkie to me is a sissy. A what? Sissy. A gay? Sissy, period. Doesn't it mean a young, under-18 gay who is like a Twinkie, cream-filled? Isn't that in the gay community? Man, I don't know what those folks in the gay community talk about. All I'm saying is we use the term Twinkie, hostess, cupcake, sissies, faggots, and a bunch of words to describe them. What does a closet gay mean? I don't know. Now, Mr. Henry testified that he saw you holding hands with Nathaniel Cater at about six hours before you were at the bridge the next morning. In the first place, he didn't see me holding hands with nobody, mister, because I done told you I don't hold hands with no man nowhere. Let me ask you, were you concerned about the evidence being found on the bodies? Sir, I haven't killed nobody, so I wouldn't have no reason to be concerned about it. And all you're trying to do is keep driving home, driving home a point that you trying to make me out to say that, well, Wayne Williams killed somebody. You haven't got no proof that I did anything. All you're trying to do is come up with some supposition. Well, if you're not concerned about the evidence from the bodies, did you have an occasion to examine some dog here? Later on, I did. Where was that? That was after June 3rd, I think, in the presence of my attorney. Uh, Ms. Welcome. WGST News Radio's special public affairs presentation, Testimony from the Accused, Part 2, continues right after this. Upon reviewing the fiber evidence against Wayne Williams, and after pulling apart the alibi produced in his defense, it becomes increasingly reasonable to accept the murder convictions against him. In fact, from a statistical standpoint, to assume any other reality defies logic. There are those who firmly believe that many other suspects presented themselves throughout these investigations. Suspects surrounded by pertinent evidence overlooked or conveniently pushed aside by authorities in a rush to pursue a quick, politically motivated solution to the situation at hand. In Atlanta, if I remember my stats right, because Jack Perry and I went back and looked at it, uh, up until that time we had generally seen probably I'd want to say six to nine kids every year killed by parents or relatives, okay? If a kid was killed, that's where you look, parents and relatives. I mean, you know, that's the people that had the opportunity and it did it. Uh, and we also probably had a 90% conviction rate, maybe 95. During the, the time frame of the Williams murders up there, I don't, or, or the Wayne Williams case, I don't know, because uh, I had left in early 1980, I don't know if they had anybody arrested for killing their own kids what they was trying to say, that I had something to do with it. But I told them they was a damn lie, because I ain't killed my child. And they kept saying, they're going to try to make me say that my child was a street kid, a hustler, or a runaway. And I told them to get the hell out of my house and don't come back. They went, it wasn't a question of me being clear. I don't have to worry about being clear or not. I know God knows and everybody else knows. There ain't nobody around me to even know me. I guess even my worst enemy can say that I could do anything to my own child. Basically, the, the general feeling is, if they think I killed my child, tell them to come get me. Um, at some point during the um, appeal process of Wayne Williams, uh, one of Wayne Williams' lawyers, um, Lynn Whatley, uh, came upon a, a f copies from a file called the 8100 file. These documents describe an investigation into possible Ku Klux Klan involvement in some of these killings. Assistant Fulton County District Attorney Joe Drolet prosecuted Wayne Williams. He says he was never told about the Klan file. Do you think you should have known about it? Um, not particularly. It wasn't relevant at the time. The GBI had it. 
The police department had it. Two prosecutors had it. Two judges had it. If Lewis Slayton didn't have it, it means he didn't want it. Wayne Williams is being represented in this hearing for a new trial by his former attorney, Lynn Watley, and two of this country's most prominent attorneys, Bobby Lee Cook of Somerville, Georgia, and William Kunstler of New York. The defense is trying to show that the police were investigating that the Ku Klux Klan may have been responsible for some of the child murders, but that that file was never turned over to help with Williams' defense. The first witness today, Billy Joe Whitaker, says he worked as a police informant during the missing and murdered investigation. Whitaker says he told police detectives that a Klansman from Mountain View, Charles Sanders, told Whitaker he killed one of the child victims, Luby Jeter. Well, I told him that I believe Charles Sanders, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, killed, uh, killed uh, this one kid named Jeter. Bobby Lee Cook and William Kunstler say they have a letter from Atlanta police major Herman Greiner that calls Sanders, the Klansman, the prime suspect in the murders, four months before Wayne Williams was arrested and charged with two of the murders. Vice President George Bush came to town, offering Mayor Maynard Jackson full federal assistance in dealing with the nightmare. And, according to attorney William Kunstler, Bush may have pressured the city to arrest Wayne Williams, even though the evidence was weak. Mayor Jackson denies it. He claims that neither Vice President George Bush nor Governor George Busby ever tried to bring pressure on him or anyone else in his administration. There was a meeting at the governor's mansion, and let me, let me just kind of tell you what precipitated that. Uh, Lewis Layton was a fine district attorney, a good friend of mine. Uh, he was under a lot of pressure to, to prosecute Wayne Williams. When Wayne Williams was arrested, and if you do your research, you will find where Lewis Layton says there's just not enough evidence. Right? You nod your head so you know what I'm talking about. There's not enough evidence. And Lewis Layton has always been a good prosecutor, had a good eye for prosecution. The local FBI agent who was assigned here at the time uh, went to Washington, and it is my understanding he talked to President, uh, I believe it was Vice President Bush. And uh, he uh, got in contact with um, the governor of the state of Georgia at that time. And uh, I understand that, that there was a message uh, uh, from, uh, from Washington that said uh, that either you prosecute or the attorney general will prosecute. Now, with your local politician, he could not, he couldn't handle that kind of pressure where the attorney general of the state of Georgia was coming to his jurisdiction and prosecute. So he had to do it. But that was a result of the meeting at the governor's mansion where information was passed down from Washington to our governor. And, 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 and this is what I understand happened. If, if he doesn't prosecute, uh, we're going to cut off all uh, uh, state, federal sharing, fund sharing here to the state. This was the first black administration in the history of Atlanta, and to have a confrontation where people died in the streets of Atlanta was something I think any black administration in its first year or two in office would certainly fear and hate happening. Yet another um, a strong um, suspect, um, I, I believe, that it could have been explored as a suspect in this case, was a man named John David Wilcoxon. Three men arrested for operating a sex for hire ring that may have existed for 17 years. An East Point detective working on the murders ran across the ring and the defendants are now in court. It may have involved more than 100 boys. Those three, plus one other arrest for sodomy, totaled four arrests in March alone. There is a, um, an unnamed uh, teenage eyewitness describing for the authorities um, sexual liaisons between John David Wilcoxon and two of Atlanta's uh, missing and murdered children, Earl Lee Terrell and Luby Jeter. Luby Jeter incidentally happened to be one of the 10 pattern cases that the state used to help convict Wayne Williams. Uh, interestingly, the jury in Wayne Williams' case never heard one word about 
any of these reports uh, made to the authorities. Nor at John David Wilcoxon's trial on child pornography, in which he would end up uh, being convicted and going to prison, did the jury in that case hear about Earl Terrell and Luby Jeter. The Cab County investigators have been working on many theories, but one that is getting quite a bit of attention is the theory that the person responsible for one, maybe more of the murders, is homosexual. I think there have been homosexual indications that have shown up in some of the cases. Uh, by no stretch of the imagination can that be spread over the entire category. This is the house. We learned today that the FBI has been watching this house on Gray Street near Techwood Homes for the last three weeks. And we also confirmed today that the special task force is also watching the happenings here. Tom Terrell owns this house. He says he's a homosexual. I interviewed him on Friday. He told me that Larry Marshall, who is now in jail in Connecticut, knew Timothy Hill. His body was pulled out of the Chattahoochee River a week ago today. An investigator with a special task force interviewed Larry's former roommate, Jerry Thornton, today. The investigator had the pictures of 22 of the murdered children with him. Did he show you all 22 mm -hmm. pictures? Yeah. Of all the kids? Yeah. How many of those kids have you seen before over at Larry's? I told him about 10 of them. 10 of them you recognized? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 10 of them, what did they used to do? Just come up there on the porch, they slayer for change and show, stuff like that. Marshall was in jail here in Atlanta up until last July. That's when, according to Thornton, Marshall started hanging around with the children. Marshall has also been arrested in Atlanta for, among other things, running a house of prostitution. But Thornton says Marshall wasn't the only one who knew the murdered children. Mm -hmm. Did Tom know all those kids yeah. too? Tom yeah. Terrell did? Mm -hmm. and, and why did Tom know them all? Tom probably knew all of them. Why, why would Tom know all of them? Because they, just, they, they, try, they try to see somebody to look up to. And uh, like Tom, they just go up to Tom us all the time. Larry Marshall went before a Fulton County Superior Court judge today for a brief hearing on an attempted armed robbery charge. But the real activity in the case is taking place behind the scenes. District Attorney Lewis Slayton admits that his office has received a list of demands from Marshall's lawyer. Demands that Marshall says must be met before he will talk. The attorney did make certain demands. Those demands uh, cannot be met, so we're back to square one on it. Uh, if that attorney, Mr. Marshall, want to change their plans and their desires and their goals somewhat, we would talk to them. Um, there, there is yet one other uh, individual. I think this is a little murkier uh, about his connection. Um, his name is uh, Robert Lee Hutchins. And uh, he was described by a uh, teenage uh, eyewitness, uh, name unknown, but his, um, in, in the Brady files it's, it's clear that he's being interrogated by authorities, who said he was riding in a car with Robert Lee Hutchins, and Robert Lee Hutchins' street nickname on the streets was Wyatt Earp. And he claims that on the night of October 9th, 1980, uh, he happened to turn around in the back seat of this vehicle and see what appeared to be a child um, either asleep or possibly dead in the back seat with a blanket over um, the, the body or victim. And he also told the authorities that he was warned by the driver of the vehicle, Robert Lee Hutchins, not to say a word about this to anyone. The significance of that particular date, October 9th, uh, has to do with that being the date that Charles Stevens, 12 years old, uh, turned up missing and then the next morning, uh, October 10th, turned up dead in a trailer park in East Point, Georgia, which is a suburb of Atlanta. Oh my God. He said, what is it? I said, they just killed my baby. He looked at me, he said, no, Miss Jones. He said, don't say that. Say, I said, I'm telling you. I said, I know. I said, I felt him. I said, they just killed him. I said, they just killed him. And he kept telling me, calm down, calm down. I said, they don't kill my baby. I said, I'm going to tell you. 
I'm going to do the best I can to come down. I said, well, I'm telling you now, they just killed him. The significance of the Clifford Jones case has to do with it being the only known case out of the 29 murder cases that wound up on the authorities' official list of cases. It's the only case in which eyewitnesses are describing for the authorities the molestation and the strangulation of Clifford Jones. There are also eyewitnesses describing for the authorities the disposal of the body by a uh, suspect who was not Wayne Williams. Therein lies the rub. The um, uh, eyewitnesses fingered a suspect, a 29-year-old black man whose name was James Edward Brooks, Jamie Brooks they called him. Jamie ran the uh, laundromat at the Hollywood Plaza Shopping Center in, Atlanta, in Northwest Atlanta and uh, Jamie w was uh, accused by um, uh, at least one eyewitness of uh, putting a, a rope around the boy's neck and pulling it and others in the room, in the back room where this um, uh, homicide allegedly took place of, um, of pulling on the rope and all the others in the room saying he's dead. Uh, there were two what I'd call eyewitnesses. One was an eyewitness to the crime itself. Uh, this boy who claimed that he was looking through a window and saw them put the rope around the little boy's neck and the boy was crying and they pulled the thing. He mentioned three names. I, I forget the other two. You, you, you mentioned them earlier. Um, you have better memory than I have about that. But anyway, he said they, they pulled it and he, until he stopped crying and then one of them said he's dead. Well, he had described the rope and it turns out this was the only one who had a ligature that matched that kind of rope. And hey, he knew, this kid knew what he was talking about. He's, I think he saw what he said he saw. I don't quite lie. But anyway, he, he said, I was looking in the window, I saw it. This window had a big fan in it. When the fan's going, you can see through it, right? And that's, that's, that's where he was looking in the window. Jamie Brooks lived in the back of that laundromat. And this is where the, the uh, allegedly he killed this uh, uh, Clifford Jones was in his room in back of the laundromat. And up on the hill behind that was, a, I think the Tates, I believe was their name, Lele Tate and somebody else. They, they knew Jamie Brooks. Uh, they knew him well. He had been in their home. He'd slept at their home. And it was early in the morning, it was a hot August night. They were sitting out on the, on the, on the lawn and they said they saw a man come from the entrance to Jamie Brooks' apartment there or his house, whatever. And they thought it was Jamie, and if it wasn't Jamie, then he was wearing Jamie's robe because Jamie had a glory robe, that's what they called it. There were additional eyewitnesses who were on a porch at a cottage behind, immediately behind the laundromat late that hot August night in 1980 and they saw a man emerge from the back of the laundromat looking like uh, Jamie Brooks. He wore the hooded robe that Jamie often wore around the laundromat, which had deep pockets in which he carried change. And they saw him struggling with a large object wrapped in plastic. And they saw him emerge from behind the laundromat and walk past a trash dumpster immediately behind the laundromat. Then they saw him walk down the pathway, the alleyway behind the, the laundromat and the other um, um, establishments in the in this strip, shopping strip there. And they saw him lay or roll the object beside a second dumpster, and then they saw him disappear around a corner. When I arrived at the crime scene, it was uh, when we were early in the morning, it was still dark. The Atlanta Police Department had set up a uh, had a crime scene vehicle there, had set up lights and, you know, was seen to be awaiting our arrival. Um, Clifford Jones' body was lying just off the back of a parking lot, what appeared to be a very small little kind of a shopping center type situation in the back. Um, there was a dumpster nearby um, and uh, Clifford Jones' body had was appeared to be fairly fresh, probably appeared to have only been dead for several hours. He had in a, an obvious ligature uh, marking around the neck. You know, had some foaming and you know around the around the nasal 
area was so it was a clear it would be a clear indication of a, an asphyxial asphyxial death. Um, there has been some talk that you know uh, anonymous caller had seen you know someone carrying a body wrapped in plastic. I had heard that several times, but there was no plastic near the body. The plastic there was no plastic certainly wrapped around the body. The state persuaded the judge to allow into evidence ten additional cases, uh, eight of them children, uh, to show uh, supposedly Wayne Williams' uh, scheme or pattern or bent of mind of killing. So what that meant in effect was that Wayne Williams had to defend himself against uh, not two murders but in effect against twelve. Significantly, however, it's important to point out that the authorities did not include among their ten pattern cases the death of Clifford Jones. They wanted to leave that out of the eyes and ears of the jury because had Clifford Jones's case been part of the ten pattern cases that would have empowered the defense to call witnesses who could get up on the stand and say I saw Jamie Brooks molest and strangle Clifford Jones. Wayne Williams' name did not even appear in the investigative file in Clifford Jones's case. So therefore, it, it comes down to the significance of Clifford Jones in the end. After the trial, the state then closed an additional 22 cases in addition to Nathaniel Cater and Jimmy Ray Payne. They closed 22 cases, charged them off to Wayne Williams, meaning 24 cases in all charged off to Wayne Williams. And of course, among those 24 cases uh, happens to be now Clifford Jones. He was then added to that case. Here's, here's what's important to understand about the significance of Clifford Jones's case. The state wants us to believe, they want you to believe, that if Wayne Williams killed one victim, he killed all 24. That's their logic. That's not our logic. That's not Chet Detlinger's logic. That's not my logic. That's the state's logic. However, if you can show to a, a strong degree of certainty that if Wayne Williams did not kill one of those victims, who is to say he killed any of them? The reason for that thinking is, is that all of these cases are held together by essentially the same kind of fiber evidence. What we've got in the, in the Clifford Jones case, he happens to have at least one trilobal green fiber that is, is significant in his case that the authorities said was significant in the cases of Nathaniel Cater and Jimmy Ray Payne, which they introduced in the trial. So it becomes very clear why they left Clifford Jones's case out of the ten pattern cases. They did want, not want the jury to hear one iota about Clifford Jones. Teresa Swindle teaches a special education class at the Dean Russ School. Tim is one of her students. She says he is a street kid who has run away before. But this time, she fears he's been gone too long. You know, he had a history for running away. And he's, his attitude, he'd sit up in class, and he was real, he's real cocky, cocky streetwise. And he'd say, they ain't going to get me. I'm too tough. I'll be in, and so, so, so. And he'd throw a few curse words around. But, you know, he wasn't going to be gotten. And that was it. And I really do believe that's his attitude, that he was you know, he could beat the thing. Teresa Swindle was the last person to hear from Timothy. Two phone calls late last Monday night. Both times, the boy never said anything, just cried hysterically. And what gave himself away this time, I said in my teacher voice, I said, Timothy, Timothy. And he said, what, what? It was just almost like a re reaction. You recognized the voice. Yeah, and he was crying. And, and I, I kept just trying to, because I knew they were tracing the call. And I kept saying, talking to him saying again, Timothy, we love you, we want you to be, you know, we want you to call us, I'll come, I even offered to go get him, you know, and I didn't care where he was, I would have gone that night to go get him. still never talked? Mm-mm, mm-mm. hung up? All of a sudden the phone went click, 
And that was the end. The, the, the one theory I've had about this case was that you had a group of kids who were being used for prostitution purposes. They were being supplied by a second tier of kids who were being paid to supply them, probably not much. And there was a third group of, kids, of people or a person, I don't know, you know who, who was responsible for the whole thing. But I've never understood why that person would exist. I mean, you know, it couldn't be enough money in it to, to set up a prostitution ring, for example. Uh, you know, it, it, you're not, unless it was somebody powerful and you're dealing with providing, vict I mean, providing services for powerful people. That, that's the only thing I could ever, but again, I, that, that's strictly theory. I have no reason to believe that at all. According to documents known as the 8100 file, wiretap recordings of the Ku Klux Klan were made during the early 1980s by the Federal Bureau of Investigations and the Georgia Bureau of Investigations throughout an ongoing inquiry associated with Atlanta's murdered and missing children. Though these tapes were reportedly destroyed prior to the Williams trial, transcripts reveal that a Klan member named Charles Sanders admitted to killing at least one child, Luby Jeter. Conversations were also recorded between Sanders and a superior Klan member, Dr. Edward Fields, editor of the racist e-zine, The Truth at Last, and publisher of the Aryan newspaper, The Thunderbolt. In these recordings, they reportedly speak of killing at least 19 other Atlanta black youths. These files and the recordings associated with them were never disclosed to Atlanta Mayor Maynard Jackson or to his administration nor were they disclosed to defense attorneys at the time Williams was tried. Together, Sanders and Fields led a Klan splinter group known as the New Order Faction. An FBI informant associated with the group, identified as Billy Joe Whitaker, told agents of visiting a Ku Klux Klan training camp stocked with an enormous cache of weapons, purchased with funds raised through drug trafficking. A statement supported by the arrest of five individuals associated with Dr. Fields for possession of 893 pounds of marijuana on July 30, 1981. This cache of weapons included M16 assault rifles, automatic machine guns, pistols and hand grenades, rocket launchers, bazookas, plastic explosives with electronic detonators and machetes. The reason for the proliferation of these weapons, according to the informant, was to instigate a race war in and around Atlanta. The informant further claimed that these weapons were delivered to Atlanta's Hartsfield International Airport in two stolen trucks and placed on an airplane, but he did not know the plane's destination. The relationship between Klan drug distribution for weapons proliferation and the Atlanta murders remains inconclusive. But upon reviewing established facts, one begins to see where intricate circumstances suggest reasonable associations. Wiretap recordings of KKK members Charles Sanders and Dr. Field's involvement in at least 20 of the Atlanta murders were destroyed immediately before the trial of Wayne Williams. Charles Sanders and Dr. Fields led a splinter group of the KKK known as the New Order Faction that dealt drugs in and around Atlanta. The New Order Faction used proceeds from these drug sales to purchase an enormous cache of powerful weapons, presumably to instigate a race war a suspiciously sophisticated arsenal for such an operation. The weapons were flown from Hartsfield International Airport to undisclosed locations. The FBI and the GBI hid their investigation of Charles Sanders and Dr. Fields from Atlanta authorities. The Lindbergh Law dictates that federal involvement in a kidnapping or murder case can only be justified by proof that the victim of such has been transferred across state lines. There is no evidence indicating that this happened in any of the cases of murdered and missing children in Atlanta. Yet the FBI became directly involved in investigating these murders, even before the crisis became public. 
The Reagan administration sent then Vice President and former CIA Director George Bush to Atlanta to pressure local authorities to arrest Wayne Williams, even after those same authorities concluded there was not enough evidence to pursue him as a suspect. As difficult as it is to accept, these facts piece together a hierarchy dangerously similar to the structure created by the CIA in their efforts to distribute drugs throughout America's underprivileged African-American communities, generating untraceable funds used to acquire weapons that were then sold to Iran from 1980 to 1988, an operation now known as the Iran-Contra Affair. These CIA weapon sales ultimately resolved two situations of growing concern to the American government. First, the transactions ultimately appeased leaders in Iran to release 70 American hostages taken in 1979. The Iran hostages were a central focus of the 1980 American presidential election, and their release immediately after Ronald Reagan's victory over then-president and former Georgia governor Jimmy Carter remained suspiciously coincidental. Second, Money was filtered to Contra rebels in Nicaragua, fighting to overthrow the democratically elected Sandinista government who sought independence from subversive American control. Though it is not known if the CIA employed the Ku Klux Klan in their efforts, proof of this would certainly provide an unavoidable link between the Iran-Contra affair and the Atlanta murders. They had to have a black suspect, period. If they had found out what we know now, that there was Klan involvement in these cases, that there was involvement in the United States government with knowledge of some of these things right now. If these things had been known back then, you probably would have had Civil War number two being fought right in Atlanta, Georgia. They had to have a black man, so you know, there's, there's no other way about it. And, and I think what happened was that once my name entered into the FBI computer system, because at the time they had a system, um, well this is classified, you're not supposed to know but I tell you, it's called Vortex. They had a system called Vortex, and once my name began to pop up with some past connections and things that I've done versus my father and all, I think the decision was made at the White House to prosecute Wayne Williams in this case, damn everybody else. I think that accounts for the meeting at the governor's mansion that was held uh, two days before I was arrested, and I think this accounts for uh, the behavior on the part of people in the White House, Mr. Starr, Kenneth Starr, who was in charge of one of the investigations in this case, as well as then Vice President George Bush. I think they made a deliberate decision to prosecute me, as they say, come hell or high water. When I was going through school, when I started in college, I was approached to work for something called the JLT program, the Junior Officer Training Program, which is a minority recruiting program for the Central Intelligence Agency. I asked and went so far as to take two trips to Camp Perry, Virginia, 1977 and 1978. And these people wanted me to work with them because I already had an electronics background, I knew photography, and they were having some problems at the time in Africa. Apparently the United States, what we were told, was involved in some action in Africa going against the government in Angola and all, and they needed some blacks to work for them at the time. So in the process of considering me for that, my name was already on the government's computer roll. And I think after the bridge stopped, when you put one plus one equals two together, people jump. And I think that's exactly what happened, panic. And let me say this too, um, at, at the time it happened, you've got to remember, uh, I, I called two names to you. I called Gerald Rafshoon, who was President Carter's chief of staff. Gerald Rafshoon, at the time when Carter went in, George Bush was his director of central intelligence. During the radio station era, we came to find out that while we were operating the radio station, I was also under surveillance by the FBI's Corn and Tail program. The NSA had a program which was also called Mineration and Shamrock. Mineret and Shamrock. If you get those files that came out of the Frank Church hearings in 1975 and 76, I am the young black reporter that's mentioned in those files where we were under observation because of our association with SCLC. They knew me for a long time. You understand, I mean, you have to understand the man, Wayne Bertram Williams. 
He was a child prodigy because he was smart. But he was no murderer. Atlanta does have some very serious, dirty little secrets. There was some high political movement on this case. My window was shot into with a 30 alt rifle and it hit, the, it hit right in the center of my desk where my chair was sitting. I, I didn't happen to be sitting there. One of the attorneys who worked on my case, George Crooks, um, was cut up into 12 pieces and put into 12 plastic bags and put in a dumpster. My investigator was shot in the back, killed. Uh, and many witnesses in this case are dead. And it's even deeper than that. When I, uh, we, we got word, the Georgia Supreme Court, we, I took the case up to the Georgia Supreme Court. I got a call from, a Supreme, from one of the Supreme Court justices. Now this is unheard of, okay? He called me. He said, listen, uh, Mr. Wadley, uh, I, uh, I don't want you to, to be dismayed by this decision. He said, he said we had reversed your, this decision. He said, on the day before it was supposed to come out, there was a phone call. He said, they twisted and they turned. Then they had to rewrite this opinion in one day. Who called? He said he's going to let me know. I'm going to let y'all know.